thank you so much for each of you who come and to be part of this. We'd like to welcome you to the 26th Annual International Religion and Law Symposium held here at Brigham Young University by the International Center for Law and Religion Studies. This year's conference is Human Dignity and Freedom of Religion or Belief, Presenting and Addressing Persecution. I'm so excited. We have a rich program tonight and throughout the next two days. Um, I don't want to take excessive time from our two wonderful speakers. Let me just make a couple quick announcements and then um, introduce those who will be giving welcomes on behalf of the university and the law school. Um, first of all, we're grateful to the law school for letting us use this room. You may see it's a little bit of a work in progress. Um, we're not having classes in here, but they very kindly agreed to let us use it. and so. We apologize for the state of undress of the room. Um, I've, um, I would remind people in general to make sure that you have headsets, even if you go to a session where you speak the language, in case there's questions. Um, if you're not using the headset, please be sure to unplug the headphones, otherwise it gets a nasty feedback for everyone else. Um, and I have a request from our wonderful students who are working with the interpreters. If you haven't turned in a copy of your paper or presentation or permissions, they will be downstairs at the registration desk and happy to help you with that. Um, as I mentioned, the video from this and our other conference sessions will be posted on our center website, iclrs.org. Those and highlights of our plenary and keynote sessions will be streamed and posted on social media. Um, let me say two or three quick words about those who are giving welcome so you'll know who they are. Uh, we're so grateful to have them here tonight. First, we'll hear from President Kevin Worthen, who's the president of Brigham Young University. Prior to having served as president of BYU, Kevin Worthen graduated from Brigham Young University Law School, clerked for Justice White on the US Supreme Court, and served as the fifth dean of the J. Reuben Clark Law School. We're proud to call him one of our own. Um, he's a noted scholar on federal American Indian law and the impact of law on indigenous peoples internationally. Second, we'll hear a welcome from Dean Gordon Smith, who's the current dean of BYU's J. Reuben Clark Law School. Prior to becoming dean of the law school, Dean Smith worked in corporate law, published extensively in fiduciary law, and taught at six law schools. Um, in addition to his remarkable career in the United States, he's also taught at law programs internationally in Australia, China, England, Finland, France, Germany, and Hong Kong. And finally, but certainly not least, we'll hear a brief welcome from Professor Brett Scharfs, who is the director of our Center for Law and Religion Studies. Professor Scharfs was a scholar, a Rhodes Scholar at Oxford University. He graduated from Yale Law School, has written more than 100 articles and book chapters, and has made over 300 scholarly presentations in 30 countries. Um, he will introduce Lord Alden, who will be our first speaker, and we'll go to that point in the program. Thank you. Well, it is both a pleasure and an honor to welcome you here to the 26th Annual International Law and Religion Symposium on the campus of Brigham Young University. Um, we're pleased to have scholars from throughout the world addressing this important topic of human dignity and freedom of religion or belief, preventing and addressing persecution. It's a very timely topic because of events in the world, and that's both unfortunate and fortunate. The unfortunate part of it is that notwithstanding all the years and decades of progress under the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, there is still plenty of persecution going on. And that is unfortunate. The fortunate part is that there, are, there is hope with legal tools, including concepts like human dignity that has been shaped in various ways for centuries, that provide some promise of making substantial progress toward eliminating, reducing, and, and hopefully, as I say, eliminating religious persecution. This is not an easy task, and you know that better than I, but we are pleased to have you here on campus addressing such an important issue. It's fitting that this symposium, which focuses in on international 
things and things of religious nature is held at Brigham Young University. Brigham Young University is a religiously affiliated university. In fact, it is by student body count on campus the largest religiously affiliated university in the United States with over 33,000 students. As you'll interact with them, you'll see that these students are very talented, very friendly, and very bright. Their entering credentials place them among the top 10% of universities in the country. They are very good at what they do. More impressively, and maybe more importantly to the topic of religion, each of them has agreed to live their lives in accordance with conduct, standards of conduct that reflect the underlying values and principles of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. This is clearly a religiously affiliated university, as you will see. But it is not only fitting that, that it be here because we're a religiously affiliated university, but because we also have quite an international focus. We have students from over 100 countries who attend here. Over 65% of our students speak a second language. That's not rare most of the countries you come from, but it is rare in the United States. Those 65% of the students who speak a second language speak 131 different languages. We offer regularly courses on six, in 60 languages, and another 30 are available depending on interest. That is clearly the most number of language classes taught by any university in the United States. BYU offers, or, 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 this last year, had degrees in, with a major in Russian, Portuguese, and Arabic more than any other, in each of those, more than any other university in the United States. But perhaps more importantly is not just those who are majors in a particular foreign language, but that every semester, approximately 30% of our entire student body is taking a language class, even though their majors may be in chemical engineering or business or finance or whatever it may be. This is clearly a place where international things are in focus. So we welcome you here and hope that you have an experience that is both intellectually and spiritually invigorating as you address this important topic. We're grateful that you could be here and look forward to the contributions that you will make. Thank you very much. Good evening and welcome to BYU Law School. There's a small platform behind the podium. President Worthen played college basketball and he didn't need the platform, but I assume this is for me. Um, <laughs> so that I can see you, and I'm grateful to see you because you are a wonderful sight. BYU Law School has grown into one of the nation's leading law schools by embracing innovative ideas and creating influential people. The faculty of this law school is outstanding, and you'll see some of them during the conference. You've already seen Professor Scharfs and Professor Clark. You know Professor Durham and Professor Doxey, and I hope you'll become acquainted with uh, Professor Moore and others, other members of the faculty who are associated uh, with the center. And um, I have to say that I am really honored to be uh, the dean of BYU's law school. Our students, as uh, President Worthen mentioned about the students at BYU generally, the students at the law school are extraordinary, extraordinary, and they routinely rank among the top students in the United States based on entering credentials. They receive an education here that is designed to be spiritually strengthening, intellectually enlarging, and character building, leading to lifelong learning and service. A foundational principle of the gospel, as we understand it in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and in the work of uh, BYU Law School, is that every person is of value and worthy of respect. I hope that you'll take a few minutes today or sometime during the conference to visit our art exhibit on the lower level, on the ground floor of this building in the Fritz B. Burns Memorial Lounge. We're displaying a series of stunning photographs by renowned photographer Steve McCurry to celebrate the law school's role in creating and promoting the Punta del Este Declaration on Human Dignity for Everyone Everywhere. I know Professor Scharfs is going to talk in more detail about the declaration later in the symposium, and of course, it is the theme of the symposium, human dignity and freedom of religion or belief. Um, and so we're grateful uh, to, be, to have that as a major theme of the law school. In 1948, in the aftermath of World War II, the nations and peoples of the world came together in solidarity and solemnity and without dissent adopted the Universal Declaration on Human Rights. 
which declared that recognition of the inherent dignity and equal and inalienable rights of all members of the human family is the foundation of freedom, justice, and peace in the world. We believe, with the signers of the Punta del Este Declaration, that it is important to remember, reaffirm, and recommit ourselves to these basic principles. And so I want to personally thank each of you uh, for being here to reaffirm remember and recommit yourself uh, to these principles during this symposium. Welcome to BYU Law School. I hope you have a wonderful time. Good evening and welcome. On behalf of our center team and uh, especially the students who work so hard and anticipate your coming, we're grateful that this day is here. You join more than 1,400 delegates from 125 countries over the last 25 years, now in our 26th year, who've come together to gather to talk about religion and the rule of law, to talk about freedom of religion and belief for all people in all places. This year, our theme combines three very important topics, and we will be discussing them and the relationship of them together. The first of these is human dignity. As we've already noted, this was the foundational principle of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and remains an important principle for building bridges, starting conversations, and finding common ground about contentious and difficult issues. The idea of human dignity for and of all people in all places, we believe has substantial power in focusing and advancing our work. The second concept is freedom of religion or belief. The or belief is important because it makes clear that freedom of religion is important to all people in all places, regardless of whether they are theistic, agnostic, atheistic, unsure, or unconcerned. It is the right of all people in all places to think and act for themselves with respect to the matters that matter most. Finally, preventing and addressing persecution. It is unfortunate that at this moment in the world's history, we seem, if anything, to be seeing a resurgence of religious persecution. We'll talk about this in detail over the next two days. But as I think about these concepts, I've been thinking of them in a vertical fashion with human dignity in the middle, and that when human dignity is respected, religious freedom becomes an inevitable and natural upflowing from that principle. And when human dignity is degraded, ignored, devalued, then one of the results is persecution. And so we do seem to have this fulcrum concept, which is very important. We've never had a group of this size. This is the biggest symposium we've ever hosted. So I hope you'll be patient with us as we work in a construction zone and uh, as we rely heavily upon our student volunteers for helping and hosting uh, you. And we hope that you will appreciate them in some small measure as we appreciate them for the offering of time and effort that they have made on all of our behalf. I'm going to shift gears now and introduce our keynote speaker, our first keynote speaker. Uh, and then after he speaks, Elizabeth Clark will introduce our second keynote speaker. It is my pleasure to introduce David Alton, the Right Honorable Professor, the Lord Alton of Liverpool, an independent member of the House of Lords since 1997. Before that, he served from 1979 to 97 in the House of Commons. It is, I think, no exaggeration to say that no one in the United Kingdom has been a more tireless and effective advocate for freedom of religion and belief, and an opponent of religious discrimination and persecution than Lord Alton. 
It is indeed an honor to welcome him to BYU Law School and to the 26th Annual International Law and Religion Symposium. I met Lord Alton last December in Oxford, where he was joined by Elder Jeffrey R. Holland of the Church's Quorum of the Twelve Apostles for a discussion on the topic, Inspiring Service, together with the Most Reverend Lord Rowan Williams, former Archbishop of Canterbury, and the Reverend Professor Francis Young, a leading Methodist minister. I was so impressed that I invited Elder Holland to extend an invitation to Lord Alton at dinner that night to come to our symposium as a keynote speaker. And it worked. <laughs> Here he is. So thank you, Elder Holland, and thank you, Lord Alton. I have a message from Elder Holland that I'd like to read. Elder Holland says, I am thrilled that my friend Lord Alton is giving the keynote address at our annual Law and Religion Symposium. Last fall, David and I participated on a panel at Oxford University hosted by yet another dear friend, Reverend Dr. Andrew Teal, who will be attending the ICLARS conference tomorrow. I found Lord Alton to be nothing short of brilliant in his messages that night, as warm personally as he was insightful intellectually. Certainly, he is as committed to his Christian faith as anyone I have met in contemporary British politics. My only disappointment is that I cannot be present to welcome him to a university I love with all my heart, nor hear his keynote lecture on such an important theme about which he has strong feelings. David, welcome to BYU. If you can overlook the fact that we are not a seaport and that we have no memorial to the Beatles. <laughs> we feel you will love us as much as you do Liverpool. Jeffrey R. Holland. Lord Alton is a professor at Liverpool Hope University and was formerly a professor of citizenship at Liverpool John Moores University. This summer in Washington, D.C., U.S. Ambassador for Religious Freedom, Sam Brownback, who was our keynote speaker last year, on behalf of U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, presented Lord Alton with a State Department award for his work on human rights. He, along with Jan Fagel, the EU Special Envoy for Freedom of Religion and Belief, has traveled to Pakistan to press for the now successful release of Asia Bibi. He is co-chair of the All-Party Parliamentary Group, APPG, on Pakistan minorities. That's a challenging place, as Justice Giuliani will help us understand. As well as the APPG on North Korea. That makes Pakistan look easy, which he has visited four times. He has also been vice chair of the APPG on Burma, Myanmar, and Eritrea. He is an indefatigable champion for the sanctity of human life, for human rights, for religious freedom, and social justice, as well as for the rights of minorities. The motto on his coat of arms is taken from the book of Deuteronomy, choose life. Lord Alton. Mr. President, Mr. Dean, Dr. Clark, Brett, thank you very much for the warmth of that welcome and introduction. I hope, uh, as you've referred to the motto of my coat of arms, uh, choosing life, I hope that my obituary reads as well as the introduction did just now. Um, <laughs> As for, the, as for the remarks you're going to hear, I ought to give a warning in advance. Speakers often worry that they're going to send their audiences to sleep. Uh, in my case, it may be the speaker who goes to sleep. Given that I've been traveling for the last 24 hours from the Far East, I've been in, in Taiwan for most of this last week, so I've been circumnavigating the world, taking a, uh, a leaf out of Christopher Columbus's book as I go back to the, to the UK at the end of this symposium. But it's a great pleasure to be with you, and indeed that... That visit these last few days, and there'll be a chance I gather tomorrow during the session that we'll be having where there'll be 
an opportunity for Q&A to perhaps open up and discuss in more detail individual cases and examples. But it was a perfect case study in setting the scene for my remarks this evening to be talking to so many people concerned about religious freedom in China and to be meeting people from the Uyghur community, some one million of whom are thought to be in the camps that have been set up in Xinjiang province to hear about the plight of Tibetan Buddhists, to meet people from Falun Gong, some of whom believe that members of their community have been used for human trafficking, to talk to Protestants who have seen some of their most famous churches, including the Church of the Golden Lampstand, being bulldozed by the state, learning that only in the last few weeks the, the Ten Commandments have been removed from church buildings and replaced by new principles of President Xi, and hearing about Catholics, who's, some of whose underground members, including bishops and clergy and lay people, have either disappeared or are in prison. So the perfect set, setting, if you will, for remarks tonight about religious dignity, religious freedom and human dignity, but also very much on my mind that we were hearing as the week went by all the latest reports from Hong Kong where the protesters have been singing as they did in, in South Korea at the end of the period of, of military dictatorship when they sang the hymn of a, an English hymn writer, uh, once in every time a nation comes a moment to decide. And Similarly, in Hong Kong, they've been singing the Alleluia Chorus. Not that everybody who's protesting is necessarily religious, but one of the reasons for those hymns and songs being sung by those protesters is the great fear that religious freedom would disappear if the Red Army were to move in to Hong Kong in the way that 30 years ago they did in Tiananmen Square. So these are not purely theoretical academic issues, important though they are in that context. They are also of acute concern to people living in places where religious freedom is violated each and every single day. We've heard reference to the Punta del Est Declaration, which commemorates the 70th anniversary of the adoption of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which puts dignity, the human dignity of every individual at the heart of the fight to end religious persecution. That declaration recalls Article 1 of the UDHR, which proclaims, as you've heard, that all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. They are endowed with reason and conscience and should act towards one another in a spirit of brotherhood. Yet, friends, somewhere along the way, human dignity and human rights have not been held in equilibrium, and it's high time that we rectified that. BYU's law school and its initiatives and symposium devoted to human dignity and freedom of religion or belief, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights at 70, have ensured that we take this issue seriously because it acts as a clarion call, insisting that when we look through the lens of human dignity, everything is given a better perspective with a more nuanced understanding of dignity, providing opportunities with competing rights claims and which they don't always uh, enable or facilitate. It's an honor for me, therefore, to have been asked to contribute to this theme and to explore what traction can be created with other traditions, such as my own as a Catholic. In 1987, in a message to world leaders, John Paul II said, and I quote, religious freedom, an essential requirement of the dignity of every person, is a cornerstone of the structure of human rights, and for this reason, an irreplaceable factor in the good of individuals and of the whole of society, as well as the personal fulfillment of each individual. The belief that freedom of religion and freedom of conscience are keystones to human rights and provide the foundations for truly free societies is something in which, of course, he passionately believed, shaped by both the horrors of Nazism and communism no one better understood what happens when those cornerstones of human rights, religious freedom, and freedom of conscience are systematically subverted by the state. But he also knew that there was another leg on the stool, human dignity. And in a world in which 250 million Christians are persecuted, and for which, according to open doors, an average of 11 Christians lose their lives each and every single day, 
it's urgent for us to explore how human dignity might play into the struggle for religious freedom. So my starting point is that religious freedom is not a nice to have, but fundamental to the existence of the dignity of every human being. It's also, when it's denied, a point of reference for all the other claimed rights. And it's clear to me that when you deny religious freedom, the denial of all the other rights is never far behind. In 1965, in a series of interventions during the writing of Dignitatis Humanae, Human Dignity, the declaration that was adopted by the Second Vatican Council, Carol Wojtyla, who would later become John Paul II, insisted that it wasn't enough for the Catholic Church to have a defense against the charge that it had persecuted and was still in intolerant. In words that were shaped by great personal suffering and devoid of references to the Enlightenment, liberalism, politics, or a narrow rights agenda, the American Cardinal Avery Dulles says, Voitila ensured that the document proclaimed, and I quote Dulles, the very principle of religious freedom was grounded in revelation, which affirms the dignity of the human person as a responsible subject made in the image and likeness of God, words, of course, taken directly from the book of Genesis, and destined to enjoy eternal life in union with Christ the Redeemer. The resulting declaration then that came out of what was the most controversial of all documents discussed during the Second Vatican Council, the resulting declaration, Dignitatis Humanae, called for the formation of people who will be, and I quote again, lovers of true freedom, men who will come to decisions through their own judgment, and who will govern their activities with a sense of responsibility. Religious freedom ought to have this further purpose and aim, namely that men may come to act with greater responsibility in fulfilling their duties in community life. The council concluded, the council further declares that the right to religious freedom has its foundation in the very dignity of the human person, as this dignity is known through the revealed word of God and by reason itself. Now, the thinking behind that document owed a great deal to the French Thomist philosopher Jacques Maritain. In Integral Humanism, he explored ways in which, in a pluralistic society, Christianity should enter the public square to inform and affect political discourse, without which democracy cannot thrive. He held that Christianity had and could survive without democracy, but the democracy could not survive without Christianity, without Judeo-Christian ideals. He wrote that Christianity taught men that love is worth more than intelligence. Writing elsewhere about how civilization could be saved from self-destruction, he wrote, today human dignity is trampled underfoot far and wide. Even worse, it collapses from the inside, for guided by the pure perspective of science and technology, we are at a loss when it comes to discovering the rational foundations of the dignity of the person and to believing in these. In 1930, in England, writing in the same sort of period as Maritain, having published his prophetic book, Eugenics and Other Evils, in, I think, 1923, G.K. Chesterton observed much the same thing, and he wrote this. He said, when people begin to ignore human dignity, it will not be long before they begin to ignore human rights. And in 1936, in his autobiography, Chesterton described his discovery of the relationship between liberty and human dignity. I didn't really understand what I meant by liberty until I heard it called by the new name of human dignity. It was a new name to me, though it was part of a creed nearly 2,000 years old. Already, said Chesterton, there hover on the horizon sweeping scourges of sterilization or social hygiene applied to everybody and imposed by nobody. At least I will not argue here with what are quaintly called the scientific authorities on the other side. I found one authority on my side. Influenced by these great figures, I've always believed that human dignity must inform the way that we shape our political priorities, that no life is so futile or so worthless that it doesn't command the right to be defended with determination and with vigor. So regardless for me of gestational age or political status, color or creed, orientation or gender, 
class or origin, all men and women at every stage of their lives deserve the protection of those who hold political office, who make laws and determine events. A country which accepts infanticide or the killing of a little girl or a little boy merely because of their gender or accepts the killing of a baby because of a disability, accepts the killing of a child because it's inconvenient, the wrong shape or the wrong colour, and destroys God's image every time it discounts or ends a life as worthless, and then removes the right of those who hold religious beliefs to be complicit in such deeds, it forfeits its right to call itself either tolerant or civilised. Friends, we have seen crucifixes removed from classrooms, Christian midwives in my own country, in the United Kingdom, lose their jobs because they refuse to be complicit in the abortion of a child. Universities, again including in my own country, denied free speech to Christian speakers. Political leaders forced from office because they're told that their beliefs are incompatible and with uh, ascendant angry atheism. So like a liberal mirror image of Sharia law, we have indulged ourselves in illiberal liberalism. Such treatment makes mock of the claim to believe in freedom. Paradoxically, much of this is now done under the banner of rights, done under the banner of autonomy and choice, a flaccid language when it's robbed of reference to human life and human dignity. It was Chesterton again, I think in 1906, in his book Orthodoxy, who said, To admire mere choice is to refuse to choose. And I think I'm right in saying that the word choice itself comes from the same root of the Greek word meaning heresy. And it is a sort of modern heresy. But whatever you do can be just dressed up as a matter of choice. Now, although this may be a harbinger of worse to come, the canary in the mine It's like nothing in comparison with the truly horrific experiences of millions of religious believers around the world. Those things I've described, they are examples, I think, of discrimination, of a lack of tolerance. But come back to the 250 million Christians and others who are persecuted in the most horrendous ways. Millions of religious believers suffer. And where are the superannuated human rights organisations when it comes to defending them or to protesting? It's as much an outrage for me when a gay man, because of his sexuality, is thrown by ISIS off the roof of a building in Iraq, as it is when a Christian is executed or enslaved. Why can't those who remain silent about the latter not see the human dignity and life of the one as being sacred as the others? So my own belief in religious freedom is much influenced by the pursuit of human dignity as by the pursuit of human rights. And that's why I say I think these two things must be put back into a better equilibrium. I strongly hold that we must be free from all coercion in these matters and that the right not to believe is as important as my right to hold religious belief, that external coercion against people of faith, which we see all around the world, prejudice is the development and fundamental well-being of society, that the worship of God is not something to be moderated by the state, that families and individuals have the right to hand on their beliefs without the state's undue interference, that states, while rightly protecting society from violence, terror, abuse or a misuse of power committed in the name of religion, must be guardians of the fundamental human dignity and human rights but underpin religious freedom. The 30 articles of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights are all crucially important to me, but of themselves are not enough. They literally tell only half the story, and even that story and that document owe a great deal to Judeo-Christian values and experiences. The Declaration was written with secular authorities in mind, And despite a nod in Article 1 in the direction of human dignity, it's rooted in the language of rights rather than dignity. Yet, as we've witnessed again and again, secular ideologies care more about the instrumentalization of the human being for the purposes of the state, an instrumentalization often accompanied by attacks on religious freedom and its adherence. But too easily we forget that 80% of the world has a religious belief, I think it was the BBC's very courageous foreign affairs correspondent, Lise Doucette, 
who said that if you don't understand religion, you cannot understand the world. And yet when you hear many commentators speaking, you would think that religious belief is just held by a tiny handful of people. 80% and more of the world has a religious belief. No one can worship the creator unless it's a free decision and entered into in the belief that their decision has been led by truth. Faith and free acceptance must march hand in hand. Salvation is freely sought and freely given, and it's certainly not codified by the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Religious belief is about the transcendent, not merely the temporal here and now. And our religious freedom enables us to shape our identity and our actions. It's integral to a person's human dignity and relationship with God. And this was something which Dag Hammarskjöld, a Christian who served as Secretary General of the United Nations from 1953 to 1961, clearly understood. He said, God does not die on the day when we cease to believe in a personal deity, but we die on the day when our lives cease to be illuminated by the steady radiance renewed daily of a wonder, the source of which is beyond all reason. I wonder if a contemporary Secretary General of the United Nations were to reflect in that same way how it would be greeted by, by the liberal media today. I mentioned John Paul II earlier on. His first encyclical after he became Pope was called Redemptor Hominis. It explicitly returned to the theme of dignity, insisting that the case for religious freedom should always be seen from, and I quote, the point of view of natural law, that is to say from a purely human position on the basis of the premises given by man's own experiences, his reason and his sense of human dignity. Now, immersed as we are in the Declaration of Rights and the importance of judicial and legal mechanisms, and I can perhaps say that in a law school, we all too quickly forget that regardless of the individual circumstances, the intrinsic worth of every human being from conception to natural death is immutable. James Madison wrote compellingly about religious rights, but he understood that they couldn't be disconnected from the transcendent, stating that religious freedom is unalienable also, because what is here a right towards men is a duty towards the creator. It is the duty, said Madison, the duty of every man to render to the creator such homage and such only as he believes to be acceptable to him. Like human dignity, this principle of duty is all too easily overlooked and probably deserving of another conference and another speech. For people of faith, a duty to God and our belief in human dignity is a non-negotiable to be defended with courage and vigor. John Paul insisted that true freedom must be built on justice and founded on the incomparable dignity of the human being and that Every human being is endowed with a dignity but must never be lessened, impaired or destroyed, but must instead be respected and safeguarded. And he explicitly stated to an American audience here in the United States that the reason America exists, the condition of her survival, yes, the ultimate test of her greatness, is to respect every human person. Robert Kennedy put it well when he said, religious freedom is one of the foundational cornerstones of the American experiment with self-governance. And 100 years earlier, in observing American democracy, de Tocqueville saw how religious freedom had been the making of America. Americans, he said, combine the notion of religion and liberty so intimately in their minds that it's impossible to make them conceive of the one without the other. Now, of course, this was often born from the experiences of Christians and Jews persecuted in Europe. And it wasn't universally true, as you in Salt Lake City know only too well from America's last wave of religious persecution and recalling how the Missouri governor, Lilburn Boggs, called for Mormons to be, I quote, be treated as enemies and must be exterminated or driven from the state. So even America had to discover in its totality the importance of that cornerstone that Kennedy would refer to. Now, by contrast, a transcendent belief in Imago Dei, Genesis 1, 26 to 28, is an amazingly liberating doc doctrine. 
Imagine what such a radical insistence on their human dignity means to the unprecedented 70.8 million people forcibly displaced worldwide. So the 37,000 people forced to flee their homes every day due to conflict or persecution. Or to the 40 million people, including 8 million children, held in modern-day slavery with the International Labour Organization estimating that in 2018, $150 billion in profits were generated from forced labor, or those 250 million Christians persecuted worldwide, or the 250 million Dalits who are told that they are untouchables. You heard I was in Pakistan last November, and I've also visited India, and in both countries, there are Dalits. In India, every 18 minutes, a crime is committed against a Dalit. Where is their human dignity when they're told that they are untouchable? Every day, three Dalit women are raped. Two are murdered. Two Dalit houses are burned. Eleven Dalits are beaten. Many are impoverished. Some half of Dalit children are undernourished. Twelve percent die before their fifth birthday. Vast numbers are uneducated or illiterate. And 45 percent, like Asya Bibi, whom was referred to earlier on, cannot read or write. They are part of the caste system in India and Pakistan, which I have seen with my own eyes. For those who are Christians, there is an additional reason for persecuting them. Their human dignity counts for nothing. Think of the children from Pakistan's Christian minorities forced to work in brick kilns, workshops and factories, or as domestic servants. Children like Iqbal Massey, an incredibly brave 12-year-old Christian boy, you can see and hear his story if you look, at, look for it on the internet. Iqbal was shot dead for rebelling against slavement. Or think about the girls now being sold in faith-led human trafficking to Chinese gangs into a country where, because of the one-child policy, the only country in the world where it was illegal to have a brother or a sister, and where there is now such a deficit of men that there is a trade in women from other countries, and one of the first targets are, of course, Christian and Hindu girls being trafficked by those gangs into China. Or think about the minorities of Christians who are ghettoized into squalid colonies, they're called colonies, which I visited in Islamabad and Lahore last year, and the jobs that are reserved for them by the state, advertised as such in public newspapers, include jobs cleaning the streets and cleaning public latrines. I've heard, as you've heard, visit, I've visited countries like Pakistan, North Korea, and Sudan. And I'm in no doubt that basket case economies and the inability to prosper are directly linked to the level of religious freedom enjoyed in countries like the United States. Measure those two things alongside one another, the circumstances I've just described from Pakistan and Salt Lake City. And look at the disproportionate contribution which is made to the prosperity of countries by religious minorities, from the Jews to the Parsis, from the Ahmadis to the Armenians. The reality is that when we respect one another's human dignity, we create communities in which everyone can fulfill their potential. Notwithstanding all the challenges and the issues which face the privileged Western democratic nations, can anyone truly fail to see how these same countries look like paradise in comparison with those where there is this systematic and cruel denial of people of their rights to flourish? Whether driven by radical Islamist ideology or Marxist totalitarianism, the crushing of the human spirit, the denial of the yearnings which spring up in our hearts subverts our dignity and our deepest human needs. Fifty years ago, then, in that document, Dignitatis Humanae, they correctly observed that a society which promotes religious freedom will be enlivened and enriched, and one that does not will decay. As an aside, this is not simply true in terms of our damaged humanity. Public policymakers and economists should carefully study the work of scholars such as Professor Brian Grimm, who points to the economic superiority of those countries which do promote freedom of religion or belief and those which do not. In 2014, Professor Grimm examined economic growth in 173 countries and considered 24 different factors that could impact economic growth. And he found, I quote again, that religious freedom 
contributes to better economic and business outcomes, that advances in religious freedom contribute to successful and sustainable enterprises that benefit societies and individuals. But friends, look too at some of those statistics I gave you a moment or two ago about displacements of people, about the reasons for war, for violence. Look at the way in which religious persecution can so easily, on the other side of the coin, not be a a reason for prosperity, but become a key driver for things like migration and the mass movements of refugees. One in five of all countries have suffered rel religiously provoked attacks since 2014. And consequently, many of those 68 million refugees worldwide have been forced to flee their homes with all the attendant loss of human dignity which that number conceals. All this happens then when we fail to uphold the dignity of religious freedom and the dignity, this is a phrase used by our admirable and I would argue the, the, the most significant of our religious and spiritual leaders in the United Kingdom, uh, Jonathan Sachs, Lord Sachs, in the title of one of his books, when we fail to uphold what he calls the dignity of difference. Recall the violence last year in the United States that led to the deaths of 11 worshippers in a synagogue in Pittsburgh. Reflect that on March the 15th, nearly 15 Muslims were massacred as they gathered for Friday prayers in Christchurch, New Zealand. And remember the 75 Christians murdered in Lahore as they celebrated Easter. Mourn the deaths day after day in northern Nigeria, which follows the genocide of Christians and Yazidis and other minorities in Iraq and Syria. All tragedies to which hatred of difference, not the dignity of difference, but hatred of difference can lead. In an editorial uh, entitled Spectators of the Carnage, the Times newspaper in the UK said, Christianity is by most calculations the most persecuted religion of modern times. The Spectator magazine said this, the global war on Christians remains the greatest story never told of the 21st century. That figure of 250 million, where did it come from? In a recent independent report to the British Foreign Secretary, the Bishop of Truro, the Anglican Bishop, Bishop Mount Stephen, estimated that 250 million Christians are persecuted worldwide, that Christians are on the receiving end of 80% of religiously motivated discrimination, so in breach of Article 18 of the UDHR, but also Articles 18 and 27 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. And to what does this lead? Archbishop Basha Warder, the Archbishop of Erbil, whom I've hosted at Westminster and chaired a, an evidence-taking session by him, he said just a couple of weeks ago, the world should understand that on our path to extinction, we will not go quietly any longer. From this point onward, we will speak the truth and live out the truth in full embrace of our Christian witness and mission so that if someday we are gone, no one will be able to ask, how did this happen? This brought back to my mind that this slow burn genocide in Iraq and Syria had its origins in the Middle East in 1914. Christians then made up a quarter of the Middle East population. Now they are less than 5%. The slow burn genocide began the year after in 1915, and it hasn't ended yet. In 1915, 1.5 million Armenians were murdered in a genocide still unrecognized as such by the United Kingdom, let alone by Turkey. In 1933, the Jewish writer Franz Werfel published a novel that I've only got round to reading two years ago now, I guess, but I would commend it to anybody who has never had the chance to read it. It, it is a novel, but it's based on the realities of what happened during the Armenian Genocide. Werfel published in 1933 his novel, The 40, 40 Days of Muzadag. His books were burnt in Germany at that time by the Nazis, no doubt to give substance to Hitler's famous remark, who now remembers the Armenians. There is a fatal chain of events that stretch from the Armenian genocide to Hitler's concentration camps and the depredations of Stalin's gulags, from the pestilential nature of persecution, demonization, scapegoating, and hateful prejudice 
to these recent genocides against Christians and other minorities in Iraq and Syria. But so often we fail to remember what has gone before, to stand in solidarity with those who suffer so grievously, or to use our voices or many opportunities to speak out on their, be up, on their behalf and to uphold their human dignity. I vividly recall a Yazidi woman, a former Iraqi member of parliament, telling us at a session in the United Kingdom Parliament, the Yazidi people are going through mass murder. The objective is their annihilation. 3,000 Yazidi girls are still in Daesh hands, suffering rape and abuse. 500 young children have been captured, being trained as killing machines to fight their own people. This is a genocide, and the international community should say so. But where have our voices been? Syria's Christian population has declined from 1.7 million in 2011 to below 450,000. In Iraq, ethnic cleansing and genocide has reduced the ancient Christian population from 1.5 million in 2003 to below 120,000. In Palestine, Christians now number less than 1.5%. Jonathan Sachs, our former chief rabbi, calls it one of the crimes against humanity of our times. In India, Pakistan and Sudan, there are endless examples of Christian persecution, and even now in Nigeria, a new genocide underway at the hands of Boko Haram and the Fulani militia. In just one incident in Nigeria last year, 19 people were killed, killed while attending mass, including two priests. On August 12, 2019, Open Doors reported that 8,000 children have now been abducted by Boko Haram, who openly say their interim goal is, quotes, to eradicate Christianity from certain parts of the country. Think of the plight of the 15-year-old girl, Leah Sharibu, seized over a year ago by Boko Haram. They refused to release Leah because she rejected their demand that she renounce her faith and convert to Islam. Boko Haram and the Fulani militias have been supported with funds and weapons from outside Nigeria. But where have our voices been? In just week, one weekend, Fulani militia killed more than 200 people, mostly women and children, in sustained attacks on 50 villages. Last year, I led a parliamentary debate in which I described events over just three days during which 140 people were killed in the carnage in Benue state. The local chapter of the Christian Association of Nigeria say that since 2011, herdsmen have destroyed over 500 churches in Benue State alone. The spokesman said, it is purely a religious jihad in disguise, another that is a campaign of ethno-religious cleansing. As in Darfur, where I personally saw the attacks by the Janjaweed militias right across the Sahel, there are often Disputes between nomadic herders and farming communities over land, grazing, and scarce resources. And occasionally, there's been retaliatory violence. But the stark asymmetry and escalation of attacks by well-armed Fulani herders upon predominantly Christian farming communities is fueled by radical ideology, and we should speak out and say so. In March, the Reverend Joseph Baturi Fidelis of the Archdiocese of Maiduguri in northeast Nigeria said, Nigeria today has the highest levels of Islamist terrorist activity in the world. Our country is, so to speak, the future hope of Islamist fundamentalists. Archbishop Ignatius Kaigama of Jos, the capital of Plateau State, says, Fulani gunmen exhibit a new audacity. And the Archbishop of Abuja has warned of territorial conquest and ethnic cleansing and the very survival of our nation is at stake. In a statement to President Buhari issued by the Catholic Bishops Conference of Nigeria, they say, if the president cannot keep our country safe, then he automatically loses the trust of the citizens. He should no longer continue to preside over the killing fields and mass graveyards that our country has become. The respected former army chief of staff and defense minister, Lieutenant General Theophilus Danjuma says the armed forces have not been, quotes, neutral, they collude. In the, quotes, ethnic cleansing in the riverine states, he says that the ethnic cleansing must stop. In all the states of Nigeria, 
otherwise Somalia will be child's play. With increasing numbers of deaths, with 1.8 million displaced persons, 5,000 widows, 15,000 orphans, and more than 200 desecrated churches and chapels, it's unsurprising that the Nigerian House of Representatives last July described the herdsmen's sustained attacks as genocide. But the United Kingdom and other governments remain in denial about this. Elsewhere, in Africa, in Eritrea, church-run clinics and hospitals have been closed over this summer period. They, those buildings have been confiscated, and the charity Aid to the Church in Need reports that 3,000 Christians are imprisoned. In China, where I began my remarks earlier, we've seen churches demolished, pastors and bishops from the underground churches in jail, along with lawyers who spoke up for them, while an underlying theme of the Hong Kong demonstrations is that fear that their religious freedom will be emasculated in Western China, as many as one million Uyghur Muslims are held in Soviet-style re-education centers. Bishop Cosmas Xi Jianjiang, who died at 94 years of age, spent half his life in Chinese prisons. Since the beginning of 2016, Chinese Protestants have seen 49 of their churches defaced or destroyed, crosses removed, and a pastor's wife crushed to death in the rubble as she pleaded with the authorities not to demolish their church. As you heard, I've visited North Korea on four occasions and published a book in which I detail some of the affronts to human dignity experienced by North Korea's believers. Two to three hundred thousand people are incarcerated in North Korea's concentration camps. One who escaped and gave evidence before my parliamentary committee, Jean Yon Ok, told the committee that, and I quote, they tortured the Christians the most. They were denied food and sleep. They were forced to stick out their tongues and iron was pushed into them. Another escapee who gave her testimony, Hei Wu, said, the guards told us that we're not human beings, we are just prisoners. The dignity of human life counted for nothing. A United Nations Commission of Inquiry, I campaigned for such, for such an inquiry to be established. It was chaired by the redoubtable and, and formidable uh, Australian judge, Michael Kirby. That inquiry concluded, there is almost a complete denial of the right to freedom of thought, conscience, and religion. Severe punishments are inflicted on people caught practicing Christianity the state considers the spread of Christianity a particularly serious threat. Mr. Kirby's commission concluded that North Korea's human rights violation make it a state without parallel, a state without parallel. He said that the evidence adduced by the inquiry was very similar to the testimony one sees on visiting a Holocaust museum by those who were victims of Nazi oppression in the last century, and he said that the witnesses told their stories in a low-key way without exaggeration. I've already referred to Pakistan, where its Christian population of 2.6 million, less than 3%, are trapped in the caste system, in dire poverty, and women like Asia Bibi are sentenced to death on trumped-up charges, with another in 70, incidentally, currently on death row for alleged blasphemy and in Pakistan, and her own cell, Asia Bibi's own cell in the Pakistan city of Multan, now occupied by another illiterate Christian woman, Shagufta Kausa, also sentenced to death along with her disabled husband, incidentally accused of blasphemy, an illiterate woman, note, who is said to have sent out text messages in English. 1,000 Christian and Hindu girls have been sought, sold into these forced marriages and slavery in China that I refer to. Many are forcibly converted. Two Christian children were forced to watch, in a documented case that has been before Pakistan's courts, were forced to watch as a mob of 1,200 people burnt their mother and father to death. Impunity in Pakistan and in many other countries, means that no one is brought to justice. In Pakistan's case, no one has been brought to justice for the murder of Shabazz Bhatti, 
Shabazz was the Christian minister for minorities. He was assassinated for challenging persecution, challenging the blasphemy laws. But he said, I want to share that I believe in Jesus Christ, who's given his own life for us. I know what is the meaning of the cross, and I'm following the cross, and I am ready to die for a cause. Friends, if a country cannot bring to justice the killer of a government minister, what chance does anybody else have? In Pakistan, I heard testimonies of abduction, rape, the forced marriage of a nine-year-old, forced conversion, death sentences for so-called blasphemy. I recently raised the case of a 13-year-old boy. Imagine this was your son. He was excluded from a classroom because he had touched the water supply in that classroom. He was beaten, and his mother was told that he had no place in that school because he was only fit for menial and degrading jobs. Such prejudice is reinforced by school textbooks funded by Saudi Arabia and compulsory Quranic teachings in Punjab, which demean and stigmatize minorities. In Pakistan's colonies, ghettos on the periphery of cities like Islamabad, I saw Christians living in foul and festering conditions without running water, without electricity, without any basic amenities, living there in their thousands. Think of South Africa's apartheid shanty towns, but without the attendant mass movements, human rights organizations, and protests by the left. Dirt floors in shacks without running water, little education or health provision, squalid and primitive conditions which are completely off the radar of Western aid programs. Little wonder that thousands flee for their lives. Fleeing persecuted Pakistani Christians ed up in Southeast Asia. Many are kept like caged animals in detention centers. And in fact, my particular interest in what is happening now in Pakistan was sparked by a visit to one of those detention centers which I, to which I took my youngest son, who was then 16. Not a penny of the United Kingdom's 2.6 billion aid program to Pakistan. It's our biggest aid program anywhere in the world. Put another way, that's over 300,000 pounds each and every single day of British government taxpayers' money. Not a specific penny of it goes to help that particular minority, that Christian community. None of it is designated specifically for minorities. Where here, then, in our diplomacy, our aid programs, our refugee programs, is any concern for human dignity? And where were our voices? Never again happens all over again when we fail to speak out. Where were our voices during the burning or the bombing of more than 50 of Egypt's churches in what I've described as Egypt's crystal knot? And what of the dignity and very lives of the 21 Egyptian Coptic Christians, although I say 21, but in fact... 20 were Egyptian Christians. One was from Ghana, who had been working with them. He was given the chance to, to escape, to leave, because he was not a Coptic Christian. And he said, no, I would die with my brothers. 21 of them were decapitated in 2015 by ISIS for refusing to renounce their faith. And in the moment of their barbaric execution, were repeating just three words, Lord Jesus Christ. Or think of Iran, where there were almost a 1,000 executions last year, including the execution of Baha'is. A flagrant disrespect of religious freedom led to the imprisonment of Syed Abedini, imprisoned for 10 years for, here's the, here are the words from the charge sheet, undermining national security. What had he been doing? He'd been hosting Christian gatherings in his home. Recall the arrest and detention of 114 Iranians in a single week for su suspected proselytization. It's illegal to preach or to convert, and converts can spend a decade in prisons like Evin, which is known in Iran as the black hole of evil and where abuse and torture are commonplace. The Iranian constitution permits worship, but not for converts. In November last, ITN News reported on the handfuls of Iranians trying to make it to England in small boats, who said, many of them, that they were Christians, some of them recently converts. But such is the prejudice against Christians that none of these shocking events that I've described have roused the conscience of nations or their governments or reordered their political priorities. 
And as I've tried to describe, it isn't just about Christians. Who among us would have expected over 120 years after the Dreyfus case and 70 years after the Holocaust to hear again the cry of death to the Jews? Stefan Zweig's magnificent The World of Yesterday, Memoirs of a European, published in 1942, has been republished. Um, I referred earlier on to the novelist Franz Werfel. He was his contemporary when he wrote uh, 40 Days on Mosaddegh. And of course, Zweig's uh, books were also burnt by the Nazis. In that masterful autobiography from 1942, that Jewish writer charts the rise of visceral hatred, how scapegoating and xenophobia cultivated by populist leaders can rapidly morph into the hecatombs of the extermination camps. Anti-Semitism, homophobia, overt racism and hatred of religious difference are all based on absurd theories of blood, race and difference which readily and effortlessly morph into violence. In 1942, in a presentiment of what lay ahead, Zweig remarked this. He said, we are none of us very proud of our political blindness at that time, and we are horrified to see where it has brought us. So failing to see events for what they are, failing to speak out, leads to these horrors. He saw how in the face of indifference and the desire for a quiet life, the thin veneer that separates civilized values from mob rule very quickly cracked. He described how university professors were forced to scrub streets with their bare hands, how devout Jews were humiliated in their synagogues, apartments broken into, and jewels torn out of the ears of trembling women, calling it Hitler's most diabolical triumph. Zweig said, the greatest curse brought down on us by technology is that it prevents us from escaping the present even for a brief time. Previous generations could retreat into a solitude when disaster struck. It was our fate to be aware of everything catastrophic happening anywhere in the world at the hour and the second when it happened. And friends, that was in 1940. Now it is live streamed into every living room and on every mobile device within seconds, including prearranged broadcast of mass shootings, St. Bartholomew's Eve massacres, courtesy of Facebook or Google. ISIS has used social media to express its genocidal intent and in its recruitment and propaganda newsletters and in its videos. The crucifixion and death of one young man crucified for wearing a cross, was boastfully posted on the internet. From the same town, local girls were taken as sex slaves. ISIS returned their body parts to the front door of their parents' home with a videotape of them being raped. The intent is a, in, of this new tool in the hands of non-state ideologues or in the hands of dictatorships is intensifying the persecution of minorities. In China, the state uses digital technology to promote its atheistic opposition to religion, but also to collect data against the observant religious adherents whom they see as a threat to their hegemony. And I might just add that it is a scandal that countries like my own and Germany have sold things like face recognition technology, which can be used in countries like China, or for that matter, some of the Water cannons and the pepper sprays that are currently being used by protesters demanding democracy, human rights, the rule of law, and religious freedom on the streets of Hong Kong. Or in Russia, the same technology, the subversion of the internet, is used to manipulate opinion and to traduce opposition. And there is a direct correlation. So what I said earlier that all the 30 articles of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights are one linked to the other. There is a direct correlation between Article 18, the right to believe, not to believe, or to change your belief, and Article 19 of the UDHR. Article 19, which hold, upholds the right of freedom of expression, to learn of different opinions of the media to operate freely. And yet there are 44 countries worldwide that control or censor the internet, I think it was the founder of the Salvation Army, General Booth, who famously said, why should the devil have all the good tunes when arguing for the use of uh, 
more interest in Christian music to be sung outside public houses uh, in the East End of London. Why should the devil, he said, have all the good tunes? And in a way, the same is true of the internet. Where it is used for bad purposes, well, it can be used for good too. And it is significant that 30, 44 countries control and censor the internet. And the five worst offenders, Saudi Arabia, China, Vietnam, Yemen, and Qatar, uh, are top of that list, all of whom violate religious freedom, while North Korea, of course, completely bans the internet. But the devil doesn't have to have all the good tunes. And just as the Gutenberg Revolution and the printed web open the pages of the Bible, the web can also be a place where faith is shared and human dignity and rights promoted. For good or bad, it reaches every corner of the globe and makes us ever more urgent, the challenge for religious leaders, to use it to promote respect for difference and to better understand how their scriptures and teachings can be rapidly disseminated and distorted to sow division and hatred. Today, Persecuted faith-led communities should be natural allies of secularists in combating neo-Nazis, but intolerant liberal voices, so-called, so despise religion that they seek to eliminate it from the political discourse and the public square of nations. They both need to defend plurality and difference of religion and belief. With the loss of 100 million lives, hellish ideologies made the 20th century the bloodiest century in human history. It produced the four great murderers of the 20th century, Mao, Stalin, Hitler, and Pol Pot, all united by their hatred of religious faith and, and liberal democracy. It's worth noting that, again, it was Jonathan Sachs talking about secular ideologies and admitting that religious faith can also cause violence, but it was Jonathan Sachs who said, don't ask where was God at Auschwitz. Ask where was man. Ask, where was man? So now in the 21st century, new forms of ideology, some claiming a religious legitimacy, have unleashed new forms of slaughter. And although the Universal Declaration of Human Rights has acquired a normative character within general international law, there's never been universal approbation of Article 18 of the UDHR, and the right of freedom of religion or belief remains a contested principle. Article 18 proclaimed as I've said, that everyone has the right to freedom of thought, conscience, and religion. And this right includes freedom to change his religion or belief and freedom, either alone or in community with others, and in public or private to manifest his religion or belief in teaching, practice, worship, and observance. In 1948, the Declaration's stated objective was to realize an unrealized objective today, a common standard of achievement for all peoples and all nations without distinction to race, sex, language or religion. Eleanor Roosevelt, the formidable chairman of the drafting committee, argued that freedom of religion was one of the four essential freedoms of mankind, asserting that freedom of religion was an international magna carta for mankind. Article 18 is proclaimed as a key, key human right, and yet it is, as I've said, under attack in almost every corner of the world. Over 80%, some 84% of the world, has a religious faith, a third a Christian. But according to Pew Center research, 74% of the world's population live in countries where there are violations of Article 18. Although Christians are persecuted in every country, there are violations of Article 18 against Muslims and others who suffer too, not least in, least in Sunni Sharia religious wars so reminiscent of the Christian wars of 17th century Europe. In Burma, which I visited, Buddhists have turned on Muslim, Muslims. I personally went to a mosque which had been burnt down the night before in a village, with villagers driven out of a place where for generations they had lived alongside their Buddhist neighbors. In Rakhine State, the Rohingyas have now been subjected to appalling brutality, along with the Christian Kachin. Now Burma proposes to restrict interfaith marriage and religious conversions. So Article 18 remains of crucial importance in country after country after country, but not just to religious believers. It is also about the right not to believe. And this is where liberals need to understand the connection. Take someone like Rafe Badawi, the Saudi Arabian atheist and blogger, sentenced to 1,000 public lashes for publicly expressing his atheism. That punishment was described by the United Nations as a form of cruel and inhuman punishment. 
Or think of Alexander Ahn, whom I campaigned for, who was sent to prison for four years in Indonesia for placing on his blog on the internet that he didn't believe in God. This then is about their human dignity too, and about our common humanity. Jonathan Sachs again says, religious freedom is about our common humanity, and we must fight for it if we're not to lose it. In the face of one of the crimes against humanity of our time, he says he is appalled at the lack of protest it has evoked. In the face of all this, we must recast the priority we give to religious persecution and make it the defining issue of our times. In doing this, we must make much more of the language of human dignity. And in making our case, we must strike a better balance with the reliance we place on rights and law. And above all, we must speak and act with greater clarity, conviction, and passion. Let me end with two Christians who died at the hands of the Nazis, and both of whom spoke about the danger of indifference and the luxury of silence. Saint Maximilian Kolbe, murdered by the Nazis at Auschwitz, once remarked that the deadliest poison of our times is indifference, and he was right. In a similar vein, the great Protestant theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer said of his countrymen, we have been the silent witnesses of evil deeds. What we shall need is not geniuses or cynics or misanthropes or clever tacticians, but plain, honest, straightforward men. He insisted not to speak is to speak. Not to act is to act. And as we reflect on human dignity and religious freedom, preventing and responding to religious persecution. May those powerful words stir us all into action. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Lord Alton. We're grateful for your passion, your eloquence, and your lifetime efforts on behalf of the religious freedom and human dignity of all people everywhere. It's my great pleasure now to introduce our second keynote speaker, Bishop Tindero. Bishop Ephraim Tindero is the Secretary General and CEO of the World Evangelical Alliance, the global network of evangelicals formed in 1860, 1846, and now present in 131 countries serving 600 million constituents. He's also an incoming co-president of Religions for Peace, the largest worldwide interfaith organization. In his work as the world leader of evangelicals, he meets with presidents and leaders of different countries advocating for religious freedom and the rights of religious minorities. For 22 years, he was the national director of the Philippine Council of Evangelical Churches, which grew to over 30,000 evangelical local churches. And in his work there, he served with the, as president of the Philippine Relief and Development Service, the Relief and Development Arm of the Philippine Council of Evangelical Churches. And he also, which I have so much respect for, did amazing interfaith work, working on Muslim-Christian relations in the Philippines and in the peace process. He's an ardent defender of religious freedom for all, and it's our great honor and privilege to hear from him at this point. Thank you. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to be with you tonight. And since you've been sitting for almost, uh, you know, for more than an hour, may I request everyone to please stand, just stretch your legs, stretch your arms. Uh, I know that many of us are still fighting with jet lag, and therefore it's better that uh, we are able to uh, you know, just uh, honor our dignity. <laughs> okay, please take your seats. Well, I want to thank very much the organizers, particularly uh, 
Dr. Sharp and uh, Dr. Clark for inviting me to be part of this 26th Annual International Law on Religion Symposium. It is my great honor to be asked to be address this event. And uh, I have not known of any group that has, uh, gain, that has been holding um, the uh, annual promotion of uh, religious freedom for every year for the past 26 years. In fact, I would say that uh, BYU, uh, with all that you have done, has done in terms of advocacy and advancing religious freedom, has done more than many other religious group in terms of what they have done. So we want to thank you for what you have done. Thank you. And um, I have not talked with Lord Alton, uh, and uh, sometimes the problem when we have two keynote speakers is there's an overlap. But uh, this evening, I'm so glad that uh, uh, I'm building on from what he has spoken about, and that is on human dignity and the freedom of religion and belief. And then I will be focusing more on the preventing and addressing persecution. So there's that, uh, that uh, confluence of our presentation. Um, so my presentation is not primarily academic in, per in perspective, but more on practical uh, considerations on what we do and why is there persecution, as well as what we can do to address, so more on, as I've said, more on practical considerations. At the World Evangelical Alliance, we spend a lot of time and energy working for religious freedom for everyone, not only for Christians, but for everyone. For example, we sponsor the International Institute for Religious, uh, uh, for religious Freedom, that produces research and articles on situations around the world on persecution or people who face persecution to their faith. And then we were also heavily involved in the pre planning and preparation for the Global Christian Forum uh, consultation in Tirana about persecution and martyrdom. And it's so significant that it happened in a place where 25 years ago was uh, the first, war, uh, first country that uh, has declared itself to be an atheist. Uh, but in that time that we had 20, in 2015, we were able to bring together people from around the world who face persecution due to their faith, and uh, that has been a practical contribution. Our special envoy to the Vatican was uh, diligently coordinating with uh, evangelical and Catholic efforts to combat re religious persecution. And then in many parts of the world, uh, we work hand in hand with peace-loving Muslims who agree that all people should be free to follow their conscience when it comes to their religious persuasion. And if need be, they can make their own choices if, uh, in terms of their religious affi if affiliation if, so if, if they so desire. Uh, now we know, of course, that is contrary to the restrictive stances held by numerous uh, Muslim governments. But uh, we try to be able to work on such situations. And then, when Pope Francis visited the United Arab Emirates in February of this year for the global conference on uh, global conference on human fraternity, and by the way, that was the first time ever that a pope visited that region of the world. I was also present there as representing the World Evangelical Alliance, and the, in one of the presentations that I had, I gently reminded the host to really continue to pursue religious tolerance. I reminded them that forced religious belief. Is no, is, no, is no belief at all. So um, if you force religious belief, it is not religious belief at all. Well, so when a major university such as BYU uh, invited me to speak about the importance of pursuing religious freedom uh, for everyone, I'm happy to come. Uh, regardless of whether I'm going to an evangelical uh, university or a secular university, or for this matter, Latter-day Saints University. In fact, I consider it very important to take our message to interfaith settings wherever possible uh, because we emphasize that we care about everyone's religious freedom, not only our own freedom. And we, show, and we want to show that we want to collaborate with anyone who shares that concern. That's why my presentation, I have actually entitled it Constructive Collaboration for Relig to Advance Religious Freedom. So we want to have that constructive collaboration. Well, 
before coming here, some of my evangelical friends actually expressed concern about coming, my coming. What, why, should I will, why should I come to BYU? Well, some of them have feared that my appearance here might somehow communicate or give the impressions that evangelicals are ready to recognize the Latter-day Saints as one group among us. But I responded to them saying that if we really care about religious freedom, this is exactly the kind of place where we need to go to. Why? Religious freedom has powerful enemies around the world. And therefore, if we are going to produce positive change, then we need to recognize and we need to gladly work with people of any faith who share our passion for this issue. Well, I try to do also to do my homework and try to say, why is there some resistance? And I found out that there are some fundamental or foundational differences between the belief systems of the evangelicals, uh, evangelical Christians, and the Church of Jesus Christ of the Latter-day Saints. And to name a few, one of that is as evangelicals, we believe that the Old and New Testament is the uh, God's uh, revelation to humanity and um, the Latter-day Saints would have additional uh, revealed scripture um, among other things um, and I have mentioned four but I will just gloss over that uh, one of that is our uh, that we believe in salvation by faith alone uh, by grace and the Latter-day Saints say that there is sal that salvation is by faith but there is also contingent upon submission to the proper priesthood authority and then evangelicals believe in the uh, Trinitarian view of God, who is eternal and uncreated being. And Joseph Smith thought that God himself was once was as we are now. Now, if you look at those, those are big differences. And people sometimes fought and persecuted each other because of those religious differences. Well, indeed, the pioneers of the Latter-day Saints were victims of such persecution. If it had not happened, we might be meeting in Illinois now instead of Utah. <laughs> and I saw that in the legacy yesterday. Thank you for that beautiful film. Um, now, I am a missionary at heart. And so I could hope that everyone in this room will come to know uh, having a living uh, have, having a personal and living expression and relationship with Jesus according to the biblical revelation as I have experienced. And I have, I'll be happy to talk with anyone about Jesus. But right now, we are talking about religious freedom. And religious freedom for all. And my willingness to stand up here is not dependent or is in no way predicated by my agreement to the religious beliefs of anyone in this room. Because, again, my appeal is we need to have collaboration, constructive collaboration for religious freedom. The path to unending religious persecution does not lie in obliterating religious differences or pretending that those uh, differences does not exist. That only cheapens our religious belief as if our belief in God does not matter much. Rather, the path to religious freedom lies in embracing and promoting these two interrelated truths. What are they? They are that faith commitment is a voluntary decision, and that second, that no religion can advance its cause by force. And therefore, it's important for us to say that in this conference, the title is uh, that uh, religious freedom is grounded on human dignity, and it was elaborated by Lord, Alton, uh, Lord David Alton to us. Now, that um, human dignity, as we have heard, is affirmed by, uh, you know, the, uh, from the Genesis account that teaches that every man is made in the, human, uh, in the image of God, the U.S. Declaration of Independence, the Enlightenment, as well as the United Nations Declaration on Human Rights. So, we can see that in all of these traditions, including the book of Genesis, they have recognized that religious faith is a personal decision and have affirmed the religious freedom for everyone. 
in the Judeo-Christian tradition, we can see that the, this theme clearly in Genesis 4, verse 6 to 7, where the Lord tells Cain, what is the right thing to do? But allowed Cain to make his own choice and make his own decision. Now, nevertheless, today in the world, there's great lim uh, the, uh, the religious freedom is greatly limited in the world today. And let me share with you at least three reasons why others oppose religious freedom. What are those? Well, based on the World, uh, the Open Doors World Watch list, and this uh, World Watch list um, ranks the worst 50 countries in the world with regards to religious persecution. And the most prominent of this reason and source is Islamic oppression. In 33 of 50 countries on the list, that is the main factor cited. And these 33 countries include countries that are not politically friendly with the United States, such as Libya and Iran, also allies like Pakistan, but also with allies like Pakistan and Saudi Arabia. And to know how to best respond to what we consider religious persecution, we have to understand why other people engage in it. To the Islamic governments, their position makes sense. It makes sense that they have to make stand in relation to what they have. Because they generally believe that requiring adherence to Islam is consistent with Islamic law and promotes social cohesion for their country. They may also believe that softening their position could weaken them politically in their relations with their own people or with other Islamic countries. Islamic states affirm human rights, but only to the extent that Islamic law permits it. For example, the Cairo Declaration on Human Rights, which was accepted by 57 countries of the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, they endorses that that uh, declaration endorses freedom of speech, only provided that such speech is not contrary to the principles of Sharia. The second source of religious persecution is what we call political authoritarianism. And it also makes sense for those countries that practice it. In many countries throughout history, religious believers have advocated for the overthrow of authoritarian rulers. Accordingly, they say, people who want to maintain grip on power, why should they open the door to religious expression? The World Watch list describes this threat to religious liberty with a colorful, colorful term. They call it dictatorial paranoia of some of those states. Now, the third main source of, of the limits on religious freedom is what we can call religious nationalism. Today, this is exhibited prominently in India under Prime Minister Modi. In his um, ideology, Hindutva or Hinduness, uh, we can see that it threatens the freedom of uh, the freedom of Muslims and Christians alike. Um, very lately, this, um, there, there has been much attention in Kashmir, the crackdown in Kashmir. The the sole Muslim majority region in India. But two years ago, even Compassion International with their child sponsorship program was driven away, was chased away from India because of their perceived Christian agenda. So these are, as I've said, are three main reasons why there is persecution, and we need to understand from where they are coming from. There are other reasons for persecution. Uh, that are below the government level. Like other people will have um, local, you know, the, um, violent action by lo local mobs, restrictions by members of the family, or sometimes uh, local religious organizations. However, for our perspective, we have less engagement or we will have less opportunity to have direct influence on those local cultural level. And therefore, it's, my proposal is let's continue to focus on the political engagement and on the political level. So what can we do to advance religious freedom? Well, occasionally, the free world can resist religious, uh, we would say, 
religious intolerance by force, like in the military campaign to defeat ISIS. But my problem with that approach is that it does not have the ability to change people's attitudes. We may be able to bomb and exterminate them, but they will still have that kind of extremism. The world's most powerful military has been in Afghanistan for 18 years without exterminating religious extremism. So what should we do? Well, let me suggest three things. Number one, for starters, we need to make it top priority. To make our efforts to achieve religious freedom around the world, we need to put it on the top of our agenda. Now, there are, there are at least two reasons why often people do not put this in their agenda, particularly in the free world where torture and, mart uh, and martyrdom are constantly not before our eyes. For example, in a church, on a Sunday, they will be looking at the youth ministries and other activities and beautiful expressions of worship, and they are not able to hear about the torture, martyrdom, and, ex and ha what's happening in the other parts of the world. And probably they would only hear that once a year during when a missionary will come and give a report from a closed country. That's why the World Evangelical Alliance Reli Religious Liberty Commission has uh, started, conceived, and continues to support the International Day of Prayer for the Persecuted Church, which of course every, every November. The other reason why religious freedom and persecution is not top in the agenda of many religious groups is because they think that uh, religious persecution is not really bad after all. When Tertullian even said the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church and from the time on people are trying to look at the silver lining behind persecution. However, in countries like North Africa, Japan, Albania, North Korea, in various points of history, we have seen that persecution is definitely not a good thing because Christian population was totally wiped out in many of those places. And we have heard from the presentation of Lord Alton that even today, there is the dehumanization and that the human dignity is really degraded by persecution. So, as I've said, we need to have, make it a stop of our agenda. Second, you know, a practical thing that we need to do is make it a universal advocacy. We must make it clear that when we speak about that religious freedom, it is a religious freedom for everyone, Re religious liberty for all. That we will not, that this stance is not only um, we are not only talking about our own group or our own people. And this is the best way to gain support of our, the concerns of other faith groups as well as from secular leaders who have a moral backbone. Our Religious Liberty Partnership, which was created in 2006, it was built to establish collaboration among organizations for supporting persecuted Christians. But it, we have formally changed the policy to state explicitly that we want to seek religious liberty for everyone. And then thirdly, third practical suggestion is we need to find, find creative, ex, uh, creative expressions and uh, creative, we would say, interventions. And let me share with you some examples. As a citizen of a country, we can be a witness to our respective governments. Thomas Schumacher, my associate secretary general for theological concerns, he is, a, he is from Germany. But he has done diligent research and tireless public activity that gave him that uh, recognition and valuable authority in both religious and political matters in his home country in Germany. So one time, or it was actually last year, when the De German Bundestag Committee on Human Rights and Humanitarian Aid, they had a hearing on how to deal with refugees and other displaced people, he was called on to be a witness. And when he came on as a witness, he provided many of the forms of religious persecution in the contemporary world and asked his government 
to do something to combat it. So as a citizen of your people, of your land, you can actually be involved in your advocacy. The other practical creative example is offer to have partnerships. Thomas Johnson, the, our special envoy to the Vatican, at a conference in Scrum a couple of years ago, he met with a Iranian um, Muslim cleric, and then he had friendly conversations. At the end of that uh, conference, he stood up and public made an offer to say that to the cleric and all others, that as WA, we would come personally on request to any country where government or major religious body found itself that we are, they are in conflict with evangelical Christians and we want to be able to be able to help. Well, there was no specific result immediately after that, but for the last 10 years, the WA has been engaging with friendly interfaith dialogue with, with, at, with Muslim leaders from at least 20 countries. We are now interacting with um, His Excellency Abdullah uh, Sheikh Abdullah bin Baya, who actually led the, the uh, formation or the uh, statement of Marrakesh Declaration, giving the rights of religious minorities in Muslim countries. In the Philippines, and uh, that will be one of the sessions that will be presented by Dr. Uh, Aldrin Penyamora, we have done uh, many years of interaction with the Moro Islamic Liberation Front to be able to bring that kind of advocacy and formalization of that peace agreement between the Philippine government and the Moro Islamic Liberation Front. So our um, interaction with the Muslim leaders is focused on the agenda that we want to say that we want to eliminate religious persecution uh, in everywhere. The other practical suggestion that we need to have would be having this academic forum or educational uh, forum. And we want to commend BYU for doing this for the last 26 years. And not only here, but in, uh, during the year, you are doing that in many other places as well. Uh, an example of that, uh, uh, well, I will not um, belabor that point, but uh, I want just to say thank you for what you are doing. Do we say thank you for that? Yes. So, um, the last one that I would say in terms of the creative approach would be a personal influence and appeal. Forty years ago, the U.S. President Jimmy Carter and the Chinese Premier Deng Xiaoping came and had that um, normalization of relations between China and the United States. And after that, in the you know, uh, private dinner, President Carter said, President, uh, Chairman uh, uh, Deng, now that you have normalized relations with us, may I have a personal request? What are those? Can we reopen churches in China? Can we publish Bibles in China? Can we send missionaries to China? Deng Xiaoping said, let me think it through and let's have another dinner tomorrow. And then in that dinner, President, uh, uh, Chairman Deng said to him, President Carter, for the three requests, yes, we can open churches in China. And then they began to open it in 1979. And yes, we can print Bibles in China. So that in November of this year, Amity Press in Nanjing would have printed 200 million copies of the Bible in China. What a result of that personal appeal and conversation. You know, sometimes when we ask graciously, as Jimmy Carter did, the answer may surprise us. Well, there are times where the governments are still not receptive, but we can participate in efforts to sustain believers under such strain in those countries by meeting their practical and spiritual needs. Or we can judiciously assist those who are pursuing more positive political and governance models. And I'd like also to say, that we should be faithful and balanced in speaking out against abuses of religious freedom everywhere. Like governments, you know, governments are constrained by their alliances and foreign policy interests, which often, you know, which often cause them to decry human rights abuses by some countries 
but are able to overlook similar behavior by others because of their own interests. Therefore, we need to understand them. And it's, we try to help them, and we try to see uh, more positive, constructive collaboration with them. And as religious leaders, we have no similar constraints or competing agendas. Let me end by saying that I would like to suggest a framework for constructive collaboration. Like all of us have a table in front of us. And if you look underneath, that table is supported by four legs, four pillars, in order that uh, uh, those, in order that it will be stable and it will be supported. In the same way, I would say that um, there are four pillars in the community that we need to, that should work together to produce stability and harmony. The government has the laws and structure. The business would have that powerful influence because of their economic, uh, we would say, uh, power, as well as the ability to provide funds to support whatever advocacies. And then we need to have the religious, educational, the NGOs, the civil society, because they have the platform, they have the medium of communication, they have the influence, and uh, they would have uh, what I call uh, the popularity that can influence. And then fourthly, as religious leaders, we have that moral suasion that we can speak to the other three. And not only that, but as religious leaders, we have the universal distribution. As we have heard, 80% of the world has some kind of religious affiliation. Therefore, as religious organizations, we need to continue to work together, collaborate, have this interfaith interaction and dialogue, and then engage with the other three pillars to promote the value of government, of uh, value of religious freedom. In 2017, and let me end with these two stories. In 2017, I was in Kosovo, visited uh, uh, Kosovo. Kosovo um, is a democratic country, and uh, they, have, they are promoting religious freedom, and they are protecting the rights of the minority, but that particular year, there was a proposed legislation from a majority population asking that those rights of the minority will be curtailed. Why will have the same level of, of freedom and uh, uh, rights as we have as the majority, they said. So it gave me the opportunity to meet with President Taki, and then later on with the Speaker of the Parliament, and then I presented, you know, we, we are watching and we are grateful that in this country you uphold religious freedom. We have heard so, uh, that you are now under pressure because there is that proposed legislation. Now, in behalf of evangelicals around the world, may we humbly request that you, pro that you protect the rights of the minorities and continue to uphold religious freedom as you are one of the signatories of the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And he said, we guarantee you that. And that in the second reading of that law, it did not pass. Because they said, we want to protect the rights of the minority. In, two, in that year also, I was able to visit uh, the Sudan ambassador in the Washington, D.C. Because there were two Sudanese pastors and one Czech Rep uh, Republic national who were sentenced to 20 uh, 20, uh, no, no, 12 years of imprisonment for the crime of espionage. I will not tell the details, but as I spoke, I spoke to the ambassador, I said, Your Excellency, the people, our people may have violated your laws and your country demands justice. And in a way, justice is being served. They've been in prison for more than a year and you have convicted them of the crime. But we know that you also uphold, you are part of the, you are signatory to the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights, and you respect human rights. May we appeal for mercy. And if we, as we appeal for mercy, may you transmit to your principal or to your president to grant them executive clemency. And 24 days after that, the three were granted executive clemency. What I'm saying here is that as religious leaders, we can collaborate constructively, and we can relate with the government, with the business sector, 
and with the civil society and put religious freedom top of the agenda. And we want to thank BYU for putting this uh, on high priority. And I hope that we can find ways to collaborate in the future so we can see more, fru more uh, fruits, great fruits, that will be born out of this collaboration. Thank you very much, and God bless you.